chat in here, Fred, from Eric Horn. And his question is, do we invite Derrick Rose courtside this coming season? Derrick Rose hanging it up after 15 years in the NBA, the youngest MVP of all time. And a member of the New York Knicks, whose second tour was very memorable. Probably the best player on that playoff team for the Knicks. Uh, what do you remember about D-Rose from the beat, man? Is that from former Oklahoma City Thunder beat writer Eric Korn? Hey, you know, you never know, man. You never know. It could be. Because <laughs> if it is, hi, Eric. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I don't know. Maybe Tibbs would get too emotional. Mm. I would love, if that were the, if that were the case, and I were covering that game, what I would do is I wouldn't watch the game. I would watch D Rose because he's sitting courtside in the yeah, scenario, yeah, right? Yeah, he's got. I would watch. I would watch Derrick Rose the entire game, and I would take notes and I would monitor how he reacts every time Tibbs yells, <laughs> and I would see if there's any sort of PTSD there. Because, like, Tibbs isn't yelling at him anymore. But I have to imagine there's some sort of PTSD every time that he yells. So maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe he'll come to a to a Knicks-Bulls game. Maybe he'll come to a, a Knicks-Hornets game and see, see Taj. Uh, I, I, I'm sure the Bulls will have some sort of number retirement for him yeah, or yeah. something like that. Uh, I, I saw Casey Johnson, who's a great, great beat writer covering the Bulls. He, he surmised that maybe they would do it when the Knicks were in town. So mm. that way Tibbs could be there and they could invite Noah. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Have, have everybody else there for that because they, they tend to like to do that stuff when Tibbs is in town. Cause they still love Tibbs in Chicago. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's crazy. This moment is happening for Derek Rose now, right? If, uh, we had this conversation 13 years ago, we probably would have thought his retirement was coming a decade earlier. Yeah. And not right now. So I think his career is kind of a testament to uh to two things. Number one, to work. I'll say three things. Number one to work, number two to perseverance, and number three to humility. Where he the reason he stayed successful was not just because of the work and not just because he was undeterred, but also because he said, I can't play the way that I used to play. I'm just never gonna make it. I can't physically do the things I used to do. So I got to watch myself. I got to break myself down and I got to find a completely different way to be successful. And that took time and it took a while. And he'll tell you it was really hard on him emotionally mm. uh, to be able to admit, like, I can't dunk on guys like this. I can't drive by guys like I used to. I can't get out in transition like I used to. And it was really hard for him to admit that to himself. And then once he did, he had to figure out intellectually how he was going to change things. And I think he obviously did that. And I think ultimately that's what his legacy is. I mean, I think I think people will remember him as the youngest MVP mm-hmm. ever. To me, that's what his legacy is. It's it's that. It's that ability to do something which most most athletes who reach the level that he did of MVP level. And most people who reach the level that he did are unable to do, which is look at themselves, say, I can't do what I used to do, even though what I used to do made me the best in the world and I can't do it anymore. So instead of just continuing to smash my head against the wall, I am going to say, you know what? I can't do it. How can I find a way to do it? I'm going to break myself down and I'm going to rebuild myself into another version of myself that's completely different, but still successful. And uh, he did that. It's not something we see very often. And I always find it very impressive when athletes are able to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's an excellent way to look at his legacy, man. Like, I I couldn't agree more because it's like when you're on top of the world as, you know, the number one guy, number one pick and and Mr. Chicago and the the run that he had final four, like just I mean, in in the tournament, just putting his name out there as as that guy, youngest MVP. You're up there with Tibbs. You're winning all these games and, and you're challenging in the East. And then to all of a sudden have to figure your way out to to have that longevity in the league. 
Because I, I think, as you said, that that could be the difference between a lot of these guys, you know, extending their career versus the ones who kind of just crashed out, especially the ones who were highly touted as Rose was. It was kind of like that evolution and that transformation that he had to adjust to mentally, especially to have that longevity. And then, like I said, even that second tour, when he came back to the Knicks, he was like a much more mature player. It seemed both on and off the court. And in that playoff run against the Hawks, he was the best player on the team. Even that new version of himself was still a beast for those games, that, that five-game series against the Hawks. Yeah, no question. And then that next year, when he came out, like yeah. that was a down year, but he played the first 26 games of that year. And Randall was like, that was the year where Randall was just weirdly really yeah. bad, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was like what was going on with Julius Randle. First twenty six games of the year, he was the best player on that team before he got hurt, and then he was hurt and he was out for the year. But he was the best player on that team. He was still coming off the bench. But when he played, they were like ten points per hundred possessions better. And a lot oh, yeah. of times, a ton of noise and those numbers and whatever else. But it's like, no, just watch the game. Completely and utterly changes the pace. Makes everyone else around him better. He turns himself into a really, really, really good player and uh it's impressive when yeah. someone's able to do that not just in sports but just like in life whatever happens something happens in life and you can't do what you used to do and to be able to have the humility you know it's one thing if you just like always sucked at it but there are a lot of people who i cover who you know i covered russell westbrook for a long time for example and russ was told his whole life you can't do this you know he comes from humble beginnings very supportive family, very supportive parents, all of that, but humble beginnings. It's not like he's the son of a former Hall of Famer or something like that. He wasn't a highly ranked recruit. He barely played as a freshman at UCLA. When the Thunder drafted him at number four, it was widely called a reach. And so he kind of played his whole life with this chip on his shoulder of basically no F you. I can do this. You're telling me I can't do this. I can do this. And that attitude is what propelled him to becoming a hall of famer. That attitude is what propelled him to becoming the all time triple double leader and everything else. That attitude is also, I think what made it hard for him to ease into being a role player later in his career, because he had his whole personality, his entire road to success had been built upon the concept of you think I can't do this? Mm. Screw you. I'm doing it. And so when it turned out that he couldn't really do it in the way that he used to, he couldn't detect that on his own. And then you end up seeing the kind of end of career that Russell Westbrook has had where he's kind of playing the similar way, playing the similar style, playing the similar role, but it just is not looking nearly as pretty as it did when he was averaging literally like 30 11 and 10 mm. one year with the thunder and to be able to have that self-awareness not just in basketball but in life is really difficult for someone who their whole life has been trained whether because other people told them this or they told themselves this has been trained to believe that they are the best and that they can do it their way and that their way leads to massive success and rose had done that won an MVP at a really young age. He's 21. And, you know, the way that he was able to have that self-recognition, it didn't happen automatically. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen overnight. But the way that he was able to do that, I've always thought was really impressive. Some guys can do it. He's not the only one who did it. I think Vince Carter did that late in his career. Mm -hmm. I think um, Paul Pierce did that later in his career. But the difference is like Vince Carter got in his decade of dunking on dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And got old. And it's easier to come to the terms to come to terms with the fact that you're getting old when you're old. Right. Because no matter how much you believe in yourself, you know that your body doesn't last forever. You know, mm -hmm. you're mortal. You know, eventually you're going to be underground. Mm -hmm. And so and eventually your career is going to end, even if you never want it to. And so it's easier, I think, to come to those terms when you're old. But when it happens when you're in your early 20s, 
it could be really, really hard to come to terms yeah. with that stuff. And I think it was. And 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 Derek has talked about how it weighed on his mental health and and all of that and how how he overcame that. And um I don't know. I think the way he, he went through his career was was impressive. He turned himself into arguably the best backup point guard in the NBA for a little while. And it ended up being beyond just winning the MVP, uh, 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 a really good career. 